Burundi under fire for allegations of torture at the hands of security forces. Does the East African nation deserve a place on the UN's Human Rights Council? I'm Imran Garta and today's newsmaker is Burundi Unrest. Human rights organizations are blasting the UN for allowing Burundi to remain on its Human Rights Council. Violence broke out in the East African nation when President Pierre Nkurunziza ran for a third term, a move the opposition said was unconstitutional. Almost immediately, the government fought back criticism with batons and bayonets. And the UN's own investigators, as recently as last week, say critics of the government are routinely abducted, tortured and killed. Burundi's government denies the accusations, saying the facts on the ground don't support the allegations out of Geneva and New York. Natalie Pahonen has more. Burundi is placed at the heart of Africa. It's one of the five poorest nations in the world. But poverty isn't Burundi's biggest challenge. Instead, it's a political crisis, which has seen hundreds killed and more than 400,000 people flee to neighboring countries. It was triggered by incumbent president Pierre Nkurunziza running for a third term in 2015. The constitution has a two-term limit on the office. Burundians have marched in their thousands as a show of faith in their president. But the space for dissenting views has shrunk. And now there's a growing number of allegations of human rights violations. Last year, authorities stopped allowing UN investigators into the country to examine those claims. But this month, the UN said Burundian security forces and allied militia groups, including the government's youth wing, the Imbonerakure, have deliberately targeted opposition supporters. Nous avons en particulier recueilli un grand nombre de témoignages we most specifically gathered a number of testimonies alleging the use, during torture sessions, of clubs, rifle butts, bayonets, iron bars, metal chains or electric cables, resulting in some cases in the breaking of bones of the victim or making them lose consciousness. The government denies all of the allegations. We see that it's a prolongation of the UN's independent investigation on Burundi finding that the government considers biased and politically oriented. The government refutes the lies presented in the different findings as well as their partiality. The government also says the accusations are an attempt to destabilize the nation at a time when it's attempting to restore peace and stability. But will it be possible to achieve that goal when the security and rights of all Burundians are in doubt? Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, joining us now from London is Burundi's ambassador to the UK, Ernest Ndabashinze, and from Ottawa, Odas Gatavu. He's a Burundian human rights lawyer and activist currently in exile. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure having you both of you on the program. Odas, let me begin with you, sir. Does Burundi still deserve to be on the UN Human Rights Council? Yeah, it, it, it doesn't uh, deserve to be sitting with the other countries that respect human rights and, and, and that uh, should be the model and, uh, because today uh, the government is, uh, is, is challenging all the decision and uh, uh, of the, the the Human Rights Council and it's kicking out uh, literally the UN from uh, from from his country. So I don't think this is a, a country that should sit uh, in the Human Rights Council. Ambassador Dabashinze, does your government still deserve to be on the Human Rights Council? Yes, absolutely. The problem we have today is that uh, we face uh, many biased and. Uh, politically mov mov motivated reports, if the, those, those investigators were doing well their job, why they don't mention how people have been trained in Rwanda and deployed to kill people in Burundi? Why? This is at least one proof that uh, 
there is something hidden in terms of uh, covert operations ongoing. And recently, the government of Burundi uncovered, for instance, um, a document uh, regarding the probable involvement of uh, European Union delegation Bujumbura in collaboration with an NGO called World Child Holland. The documents we uncovered are clearly showing how some of our partners have been involved in this uh, regime change in Burundi. Sure. But, so, but the another issue. Ambassador, if you allow me to uh, interject here, the document shows mm -hmm. that the European Union helped War Child, a Dutch NGO, evacuate some human rights activists from persecution. How does that spell regime change? No. The War Child was used to help insurgents who have been involved in killing, involved in uh, the failed coup of May 2015 to escape, to escape, not to respond to justice. Okay. This, this is unacceptable in any country in the world. When people are responsible of crimes, they should go and respond to the crime. Okay, that's Otherwise, a yes. we need to, to, to say clearly that they support, they support the regime change in Burundi. Okay. A good is for regime change, no? Okay, understand your perspective. Or does, doesn't the ambassador make a point? He believes that the European Union and War Child were involved not in evacuating human rights activists, but people who were involved in a failed military coup. Uh, I think uh, there is a problem because that government thinks that uh, there is a global conspiracy against it, and uh, it, it's, uh, it becomes very difficult to deal with that kind of government. Uh, what uh, the EU uh, did and uh, is even doing in other countries, they are protecting those who are at risk, human rights activists. And uh, doing that is something that they are proud of, and this is uh, something that saved life. And in interpret interpreting this as a, a, a plot for regime change, I think it's uh, it's uh, it's it's groundless, and uh, there is no any point that uh, uh, the ambassador okay. made uh, out uh, out of this uh, this claim. Okay, so Ambassador Dabashinze, let's try and stitch some of these things together here. So Odas says that this government believes there's a global conspiracy against it and it doesn't want to face up to the truth. You're saying the European Union is involved in regime change in Burundi. You're blaming Rwanda for killing people. The, the government has also blamed Rwanda for trying to assassinate an aid to the president. You say the International Criminal Court is biased and you're thinking of pulling out of it. Putting all those things together, it seems as if there's a pattern here to make his point that perhaps this government is paranoid and it believes the whole world is out to get them and emphasized by the fact that it won't let in any independent investigators to actually find out for themselves. Why don't you let in the investigators so they can find out? First of all, I have to to mention that I never affirmed that the European Union was involved. I said the, the leaked document is, prov is proving a, a probable involvement, a probable. Right. It, it, so it's not, I, don't, I didn't affirm. Another issue, you may be uh, aware about a, a report produced by uh, a group of experts of Security Council. In this, in this report, submit to Security Council, uh, brought proof of um, some people trained in Rwanda and sent to Burundi through DRC. Those people have been arrested in DRC. There is a report, the report was submitted to the Security Council mm -hmm. in February last year. And Burundi, Burundi and DRC requested the media, the, the, Secret, the Security Council to convene an urgent meeting to address this issue at this right. stage. But, but no I'm meeting on these facts. So what I'm, so what I'm struggling wrong. to understand here, yeah. what I'm struggling to understand here is you're citing the Security Council report here when it comes to proving your point or making your point for you that Rwanda is to blame. But then when I mention the Commission of Inquiry on Burundi, where they say torture is happening and there's grave human rights abuses, you're saying they have no credibility there. So the UN is only credible when it suits your agenda, sir. No, what I'm saying is, if it was uh, 
experts are really fair-minded. Why they don't mention this case of Rwanda? Why they don't work on this report pro produced by uh, a UN Security Council committee? Why this question is untold? Another issue, uh, in February 2016, Top U U U.S. Uh, high officials recognize in hearing in the Senate, I was still there as ambassador of Burundi, mm -hmm. that there is proof of involvement of Rwanda. Okay. You, can, you can visit the website so of the Senate, about, the US I'd, Senate I'd love to bring while a this question is on. not addressed. Very good, sir. And, and I'd love to bring a Rwandan Very, official on, and I can hold him or her to account, and I, can, and I can pose all of this to the Rwandan official. We don't have one right now, so let's deal with the accusations leveled at Burundi. Once again, let me go back to the report of the Commission of Inquiry on Burundi. And let me quote this to you. We were struck in our investigations by the feeling of deep and widespread fear running through the testimonies we gathered. Today we can say that our initial fears concerning the scope and gravity of human rights violations and abuses in Burundi since April 2015 have been confirmed. And they also said we were struck by the particularly cruel and brutal nature of the violations described to us. And now all of this was them interviewing people in camps outside of the country because they weren't let into the country. Can you at least accept, Ambassador, that maybe it's best for your country to let them in? Because then if you're saying they're biased or they got it wrong, you can say we let you in to see for yourself. You're not letting them into the country. I got your point. If people are really fair-minded, if people are really want to, willing to address the issue and address or all the aspects of the, of the situation, yes, we allow them to come. But if people are just coming to blame the government, ignoring other aspects of the, the problem, I mentioned the Rwanda, I mentioned about uh, criminals who have been escaped with the help of all child Holland. So you will see yourself, it's biased. How can we allow a team of experts, so-called experts, who have been producing biased reports, ignoring even, men, even the report of Security Council, UN Human Rights Commission border, it's a, it's, a, it's a UN body. Why this report is not taken into account? Okay. What is behind? I need, we, we need the answer to that one. When we have the answer to those questions, when we answer the answer to why people have been helped to escape when they are involved, in the regime change. Some people involved in, in military coup are abroad, are protected. Some of them are in Rwanda, others are outside. They don't mention them. When those questions will be addressed, yes, okay. a team of so experts ask, should okay. be sent to Burundi. Okay. But there is many conditions first. Okay, so we hope a team of experts will be allowed into Burundi at some point soon. There seems to be some hope there. Odas, are you hopeful that eventually the, the government will allow independent experts in? Yeah, I, I, I don't think they will allow because uh, in, in the oral report that was presented, the commission, the chair of the commission has said that even the, 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 repre the permanent representative of Burundi denied to receive them even in Geneva. And this was not even in Burundi. This, uh, this was not a, an investigation that, was, that they were going to do in, in his office. So if they denied even... A, a, a meeting, uh, where it, it, that means that uh, they are not ready to, to, to let go in and investigate. And, and what, what, uh, what I think should be uh, uh, discussed here is, he, he is uh, the ambassador is uh, bringing these uh, issues of Rwanda and 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 and, and all the, the international institutions. But here we are dealing with lives that are being uh, lost. Okay, let's talk about the those report. Lives. Said that uh, sure. a thousand. Sure, let me let me come yeah. in. Let, the, let, the let report me, said. Bring... Okay, finish your sentence, sir. There's a slight delay. That's why I apologize. But finish your sentence, and I'll come in. Yeah, uh, the, the main issue that is on the table is lives that are being lost. The reports uh, indicate that there are thousands of people that have been killed. There are hundreds of people that disappeared. And, and this is, is something that is occurring, occurring at a daily basis. So uh, do the government is justifying the, 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 those, uh, those uh, killings. 
uh, are they saying that because there is this problem with Rwanda, because there is this problem with, with this institution, uh, they don't, uh, they, they cannot respond to what is going on? Okay. So that's that's okay. the main issue okay. there. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Let me bring in the ambassador, Ambassador Dabashinze. Four hundred thousand, more than four hundred thousand Burundians have actually fled the country. It's a small country, a small population. So that's a massive amount of people. More than two hundred thousand internally displaced. If even if we grant you that international institutions might be biased against the country, even if we say the Rwandans might be causing trouble. I don't know if they are, and I'd like to actually hold them to account. But even if we grant all of that, why are so many people fleeing your country and living in refugee camps in Tanzania, in Kenya, and so on, outside the country, they're fleeing for their lives. If things are under control and people are not being tortured and not being killed, why are so many people fleeing, sir? Let me respond to you. First of all, the media forget to mention that many of them, a lot of them are back home. This is one fact. A second fact, this covered propaganda from the media, from by the report, of course, it, this, this propaganda is aimed to create a kind of sentiment of uh, insecurity. Do you think that someone who is in a, in a, in a refugee camp somewhere, when he hear on all of the media that uh, people are to the church, of course, he will, he will be... He will, he, will fail, he, will, he will have problems of uh, confidence to go back to Burundi. This propaganda is causing problems. This is what I'm saying. And let, let me mention it again. If the UN is helping us, if uh, uh, is helping us, why all those questions are not put at the table? We are saying we don't, we, we don't fear. Bring sure. all the questions, all okay. the questions on the table. Why do you select? Okay. For which interest? Okay, sir. Why do you select? I have no interest here. I'm trying I, to get I, to the bottom of it, I right? But let me ask you, sir. Let me I ask think you. I, given I that, think, uh, hold I think on, I, hold on, Odess, just for a second, Odess. Uh, Ambassador, given that the UNHCR yes. themselves are helping these refugees, yes. and you say many of them are back home, it's, it's just not true, sir. We have reports from all of these camps. Some of them are countries. back home, DRC, yes. DRC, Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, Malawi, Tanzania, more than 400,000. You're saying that the UN is not helping your country. But the UN is the, is the one who's feeding these people and housing these people outside of your country. I'm not saying the UN is not helping our country. I'm raising some issues we should address to overcome the current situation. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. I say UN is helping, but UN should help also by, produ by producing uh, not not by the report. On one hand, you have a team of experts at the Council producing report. The report is put in the garbage. On the other hand, you, you have in Geneva uh, some report, allegations not, not yet verified, uh, are taken in, into consideration. Well, it, it's, it's unfair. Let's bring all of the aspects on the table. Yeah, let's bring all of the aspects on the table and discuss on the issues. Discuss on the issue of refugee. Discuss on the issue of involvement of Rwanda. We have proof. Discuss on the, on the okay. issue of on the insurgent. Discuss on the issue of those who are involved in military coup. This propaganda is aimed to protect those people involved. So now they're transforming them in human rights. You, you know what you mean is a military coup. A military coup, they use tank, military tank, and right. it's destabilizing a country. And we have a history in Burundi, let's mention to you. We have a history in Burundi where a president-elect was killed after three months in office, and those people killed him. Military as a civilian are still free today. Why okay. this question is not addressed? Okay, they, want, they want to repeat the same. Okay. Uh, Burundi, we, Burundi people, we react. We never allow those, uh, again, people who are interested in a divide and rule policy to, to continue to bring death to Burundians. Enough is enough. We suffered a lot. Okay, so, Odess, does any of that convince you the ambassador is yeah. making an impassioned appeal? Yeah. Yeah, I think there is a, there is a good point you raised of uh, the flows of people from Burundi to neighboring countries. This is a, a clear indicator that uh, there is something wrong that is going on. And when he said that there is a propaganda that is going on, you have to know that uh, currently there is no any independent media that is uh, is working in the country. Even international media are kicked out and uh, no no no. 
no one is practically allowed to, 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 to enter the country and, and investigate. So one should ask uh, himself what what that propaganda is is, is being uh, uh, how the population is is uh, is, uh, is, uh, is is receiving that propaganda there is no 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 any radio that is broadcasting right now except okay. the government radio, radio and, and and television so okay. that's mean that in the far country, in the far uh, country, uh, in the far uh, region of the country, there is something that is going on that push people to go out, to go, to go outside. And this is uh, uh, the, the, the militia in Monirakure that are uh, quite controlling all the territory of okay. of, of, of Burundi. Odes, so I've got to jump in there because I've got to move on. We Odes, uh, allow me to come in there because I've got to move on. Yeah, and you know it is the worst funded refugee crisis in the world. So whatever your politics is a terrible situation in terms of the refugee crisis. Only 2% of the funds needed have been received according to the UN. Terrible situation and we hope for better times for the people of Burundi. Odas Gatavu and Ambassador Ernest Dabashinze, it's been a pleasure having both of you on the program. Thank you very much. Coming up on the program is Egypt trying to erase its recent revolution and military coup from the history books. And I speak to famed author William Dalrymple about the controversy over Queen Elizabeth's crown jewels. Egypt is taking a different outlook to the topplings of Hosni Mubarak and Mohamed Morsi. That they didn't happen. The country's education ministry is telling schools to remove all references to the 2011 revolution and 2013 military coup. Now, such censorship is nothing new for Cairo. When Egypt wanted to give two islands to Saudi Arabia as a token of goodwill, it sparked a backlash from Egyptian nationalists. And the government responded by taking the islands off of classroom maps. Call it a out of sight, out of mind policy. Sandra Gatman reports that the motivation behind the moves far surpasses what's written on the blackboard. It was an uprising that transformed the country and sent ripples of political dissent across the region. Hundreds of thousands of Egyptians demanded their president go, and he did. Hosni Mubarak was jailed and ousted. Then, Egypt's new president, Mohamed Morsi, was pushed out in a military coup led by Abdel Fattah el-Sisi with the backing of some in the country. But according to Egypt's new school history books, those events may as well have never happened. The Ministry of Education has decided to remove mention of both events from the national curriculum and instead widen it to include the First and Second World Wars and the history of colonialism. Plenty of other countries have done the same. In Japan, school history books don't mention war atrocities committed in China or Korea. Lebanese school books largely stop before the 1975 civil war because the country's different sects can't agree on a unifying narrative. In the U.S., the Education Board in Texas brought in new books that refer to the slave trade as the Atlantic Triangular Trade. Perhaps governments understand what George Orwell was getting at in his novel 1984, where the fictitious ruling party adopts the slogan, who controls the past controls the future who controls the present, controls the past. Is Egypt within its right to revise its curriculum? Or is this the latest sign of a trend to silence political opposition? Egypt's president, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, has been under fire for rounding up supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood and other opponents. A new bill to restrict the work of NGOs is also raising eyebrows. NGOs are now limited to social work only, and foreign organizations must pay up to $16,500 to work in Egypt. NGOs can no longer publish studies without government approval, and the price for non-compliance includes jail time. Egypt's defense is that NGOs and activists funded by foreign actors are a threat to national security. This is what is expected in Egypt, but until we are completely banned from defending human rights, we will not give up our role and we will continue. 
Egypt is a police state and it will not become democratic until there is democracy. The Egyptian army is fighting several armed groups in Sinai and supporters of President Sisi say tighter controls are justified. Critics, though, fear a return to Egypt's police state that was toppled by protests in 2011, an event that will no longer be discussed in classrooms. Sandra Gatman, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss this further, I'm joined now from Washington, D.C., uh, by the president, uh, former president of the Egyptian-American Alliance, Mukhtar Kamil, and from London, Omar Ismail. He's a political commentator focusing on Egyptian affairs. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Mukhtar Kamil, if I can begin with you, tell me why Egypt is rewriting history. I don't think uh, Egypt is the one who is rewriting history. What's rewriting history, in accordance with what I heard from you right now, is a regime that is governing Egypt. And they are rewriting history because they seem to be insisting to, uh, to be viewed by the people, by the Egyptian people, as criminals. Rewriting history is a criminal act. And it can be almost treason, high treason, because rewriting history falsely means that you are producing generations with a myopic view of the future and a distorted view of reality. OK, Omar Ismail, this is nothing new. Right? I mean, uh, it, it, it appears as if 1967, 1973, those wars, many Egyptians were led to believe in, in, in the school textbooks and so on that Egypt won and there were no problems. So given the broad historical lens, it's nothing new, right? Well, I think really if you look back in history, uh, Egypt is uh, 7,000 years civilization. Uh, and the habits of uh, rulers uh, when uh, they take over was always to remove any, any uh, traces of uh, previous rulers uh, uh, and try to um, spin uh, what the um, events to their, to, to, to their advantage uh, or to big themselves, uh, big themselves up uh, and make themselves look uh, bigger than they really are. Uh, but I, I think I, I just have some reservation regarding the uh, removal of the, uh, or the alleged removal of uh, the mention of the 25th of January and the 30th of, Ju uh, of June. I, I think if, for those of us who are actually closely uh, in contact with Egypt and closely watch what is going on in Egypt, uh, Egypt actually declared uh, a public holiday on the Thursday, which is the 29th of uh, uh, of, uh, of, of June, um, which in, in celebration of what's happened right. in, uh, in, in the 30th of June. Whether we call it a coup uh, or, or, or a revolution, I, I'm not really going into this Okay, so all. let me, so let me give you specific sense. what happened significant. Sense. Sure, okay, so 2013 mass protests. Yes, the current CC government would like to look at it, you know, very positively and see it as a sort of revolution, right? Let me give you the specifics here. The Ministry of Education had decided to remove mention of 25th of January 2011, that uprising, that revolution, and you can call it whatever you want to, and the 30th of June 2013 from the high school curriculum. And this was reported in Al-Ahram. So state-owned, is the voice of the state right now, no reason to, to doubt it. So. High school students are not learning about these two events. What, what benefit can that be to the high school students? Well, well I'll have to say, and I, one has to be obviously <laughs> uh, true to history, uh, and, and what, it, it cannot be uh, simply ignored. A significant uh, event that happened on the 20, 25th of January, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, you can't really ignore it. But uh, that's what they're because doing. Because it has changed. Yeah, what they, they, well, I, I think they're to totally misguided because whether you are were, uh, supportive of the event or not, uh, it has a significant... Uh, 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 it affected uh, the Egyptian uh, government and the Egyptian psyche hugely. And it has a significant effect that the Egyptians are still feeling it since the mm -hmm. 20, 25th of January. And it actually led to a change of direction. And it ended up 
uh, attacking you from Mubarak. I guess it would be very difficult to, to, to deny it. Even yeah. for the supporters of the regime, the staunch supporters of the regime, it's going to be very difficult for, for any supporter of the Sisi regime to, to really justify this thing. Because, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's catastrophic. I mean, it's catastrophic. It is filthy. It, it can't be defended. Right. And, and Mukhtar Kamil, in, in the age of social media and the fact that young people are going to get their information from somewhere, they're going to go on to <laughs> Wikipedia and, and other places, right? So given that school's not teaching it to you, but you're going to get this information elsewhere, what kind of political maybe resentment is that going to harbor? Down the line, is it going to make things worse? I would say, of course. I would say that the younger generations who are going to see history through the lenses of the social media and find that what they are told at school is different, they will be even more contemptuous of older generations who are teaching them that. They will be more contemptuous of the regime that is governing, governing assuming that the regime, this regime, is going to survive. That's one thing. A second point that I would uh, like to, uh, to make is that one of our problems, really, is the fact that we are kind, as Arabic-speaking people in general, we are kind of lenient about distorting history. And because of that, we in Egypt right now are in political tribes, are divided into mm -hmm. political tribes. For instance, had the Islamists studied histories, uh, history uh, uh, without any falsification, they could have been in govern government right now, in ruling right now. The same thing applies to the Nasserists and the uh, Pan-Arabism. It applies to the military regime right now. The third and final point that I would like to comment on, your guest uh, from uh, London, is that saying that we Egyptians, through 7,000 years of history, have always been used to rulers coming and facing the previous rulers' uh, achievements and events is really uh, kind of counterproductive. It is okay. partly, so, partially true. Okay, so let's get Omar Ismail to, to respond to that. Omar Ismail, this is not business as well, usual for Egypt, and maybe it's giving the government a free pass by saying, we've always done this. Yeah, and, and I think really just a uh, respond to, to, to the uh, respected colleague from America. Uh, and I, I think if you look even uh, uh, as near as the last 60 to 70 years, and we've seen what Nasser did uh, uh, and completely uh, tried, or I wouldn't say Nasser, but uh, the regime then have tried, uh, I wouldn't say Nasser in particular, but the regime yeah. have tried in, in a way to, 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 to totally uh, discredited the royal family that uh, ruled Egypt uh, from Muhammad Agreed. Ali's days to Farouk's days. They have, uh, the royal family, again, whether you agree with what they did or didn't do, uh, has a made uh, impact on, 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 on Egyptian life, huge impact yes, on yes, Egyptian yes, yes, life, yes. and enriched the yeah. huge, uh, Egyptian life. Nasser came in and completely discred discredited that. So that, after Nasser tried, and maybe to a certain degree, have succeeded in you know, uh, well, he was, uh, you know, paying a lip service to uh, the history of Nasser and, 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 uh, and what Nasser has Yeah, I, I was just, if you allow me, history. if you allow me, sir, sir. Please. If you allow me, I was just commenting on the 7,000 years thing because right. that kind yeah. of... But, but of, I, I of, think the point, it, it, the point it, it, I'm not, trying not, to make... I agree with you. I completely... Just one second, please. Yeah. I completely agree with you concerning yeah. Nasser Sadat and so on and so forth. But w w the part yeah. that I do not agree with is accusing the Egyptian civilization, which continued... I mean, I don't mean you mean that necessarily, but it implies that. Uh, accusing it of having always been like that, denying history, falsifying history, because that way it, we give justification for what is going okay. on today sure. and what Nasser has done, which you indicated. It, it, okay, it, but it, I, think it, you, it, I think we got it, to it the is not a, It's not a justification, sir. He it isn't is justifying it. Okay, he didn't mean that. No, that certainly, the Egyptians you didn't mean it. are accepting... Right. It, no, the Egyptians true. are readily accepting okay. what really uh, the rulers always do and did okay. in their name. 
They uh, didn't in 2011. I, I totally agree habits. with you. Okay. That's true. No, okay. I, I understand. You two agree with each other. Maybe you disagree with the way he expressed it. Let me ask you, Mukhtar Kamil, about something related to this, related to the history books and related to the maps. Now, you might think there might not be any tangible benefits to removing the references to 2011 and 2013, and it might only be counterproductive. What about the two islands, Tehran and Sanafir? So, it's off the maps, right? And the sovereignty is out of the textbooks. There's a tangible benefit to that because there's Saudi money coming in to the government. So can you maybe see the tactical benefit to the government that, okay, let's take out our references to the islands, and that means we get Saudi investment? Uh, no, the islands business is nothing short of high treason. It is more than and deeper than just a few billion dollars we are getting from Saudi Arabia. The issue is basically the internationalization of the Straits of Tehran. And that internationalization is very, very serious for the Egyptian national security because simply Israel any time in the future can build a railroad, for instance, from Elad to the Mediterranean or to any place, can build uh, oil pipelines uh, to compete with the Suez Canal, or even can dig a canal, which I, I kind of think that it is not a, a, a possibility for the time being. But basically, taking such a strategic card from the country for nothing, right. Uh, other than few billion dollars, and the fact that Israel is cooperating with Saudi Arabia against Iran, th that is okay. high treason. Okay. As so simple you as that. High okay. I'm running out of time. So, Umar Ismail, let me ask you, should we be considering what's happening with the textbooks and how the youth are being educated in the same basket and the same atmosphere as media outlets being shut down, NGOs under a new law being regulated and, and stitching all of these together and saying there's a particular atmosphere to the CC government that includes all of this and it doesn't look good. Is that fair? Look, uh, the Egyptian people are intelligent and they know exactly what their history is and they would know in future, uh, 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 of future generation to come what does really happen on the 25th of January, 25th of January 2011 has effectively changed the country's direction. It might be that in, in, the country's direction at the moment is aimless and it is un, seem, seemingly unsuccessful, but nonetheless, a change has taken place. And these facts will remain facts whether the uh, uh, Ministry of Education in Egypt like it or not. Okay. Unfortunately, we're out of time. It's been a pleasure talking to both you gentlemen. Thanks so much, Mukhtar Kamil and Omar Thank Ismail. You. Thank you. Hope to have you on the program again. A far-reaching, yet isolating affliction. Misunderstood, stigmatized, and often untreated. Somalia has one of the highest rates of mental illness in the world, with an estimated one in three people suffering from some sort of mental disorder, such as depression, anxiety, or schizophrenia. Driven by severe trauma, from years of conflict and ongoing security concerns, displacement, poverty, and widespread substance abuse. While decades of political instability has left a whole generation of Somalis without access to proper social services. Somali government, I mean, they have done a lot in terms of uh, keep making it a priority, but it's, it's mainly up to the donors to, to support this uh, this program and this this issue. Since it's not a life-threatening situation, so uh, humanitarian donors do not fund it. Somalia has very few qualified mental health professionals, with much of the care provided through private donors or NGOs. For psychiatric practitioners, a lack of awareness and access to essential medicines are the biggest barriers to providing care. The Somali tech trace they are misdiagnosed with mental ill patients. The people of mental ill, they need long time treatment. We need special knowledge to train nurses or doctors. With limited resources, people's families are often left to care for them. But mental illness is not well understood in Somali culture. 
and many of those suffering are stigmatized and socially isolated. And in many cases, they are kept in chains, sometimes for years. Most of the, 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 the patients and the families, they, they seek care from the religious and traditional healers. So by the time they get to the professional help, it's already too late. Will Somalia and the international community respond to this overwhelming need, providing the resources, understanding and attention to stop Somalia's mentally ill from falling through the cracks? Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. It's an act of sabotage. Daesh entered into the site of King Ashar Hadun's palace, which lies under the mosque of the Prophet Yunus, a well-known mosque in Mosul. As you can see, the digging was very extensive, and it includes a ramified tunnel network, with one tunnel leading to another, in an attempt to dig an area as large as possible in order to unearth and loot artifacts. One of the historical prizes of Mosul has been lost forever after Daesh reportedly blew up the Grand Nuri Mosque as Iraqi forces closed in on the area. The government called it a victory, while historians mourned the destruction of the mosque's leaning minaret that towered over the city for the past 800 years. It's a recurring uh, heartbreak in Iraq. Museums in Baghdad were pillaged during the toppling of Saddam Hussein. And this year, a raid on a home in Bulgaria uncovered stone tablets predating the existence of Rome. Analysts say they were most likely sold to the smugglers by Daesh. Well, to talk more about how precious pieces of history end up on the black market, I'm uh, joined now uh, in London by William Dalrymple, who describes himself on Twitter as a writer, historian, and a goat herder, presumably on his farm in India. He's also written the book Kohinoor, the history of the world's most famous <laughs> diamond. Good to have you on the program, sir. And we're going to talk exclusively about your book in a moment, but I want, I want to use the opportunity to ask Thank you, you Imran. Uh, oh, yes, uh, welcome to the program. I want to use the opportunity before we talk exclusively about your book to ask you, does it depress you as a historian that we're seeing all these, you know, this magnificent heritage in, in Iraq and Syria either being smashed up, blown up, we're seeing the curators beheaded, uh, we're seeing some of this stuff being sold on the black market to further bankroll terror as a historian? Does it cut your heart out and, and rip it to pieces? I've never been to Mosul, but I've spent a lot of time in Palmyra, and the, uh, many of my favorite monuments in Syria have been destroyed in the last five to ten years. And, of course, it's deeply heartbreaking. But, of course, it's just part of a wider picture. We've seen similar stuff in Timbuktu, in Afghanistan, at Bamiyan, in the Kabul Central Museum, and uh, this terrible iconoclasm, which, uh, which uh, seems to have uh, come with these Salafi uh, uh, Irhebi groups. Are we losing that battle against them? I don't know whether we're losing the battle. Certainly in Mosul, um, obviously, the Iraqi forces are, are, are retaking uh, the city. Uh, Timbuktu, which was uh, taken by al-Qaeda in 2012, is now back in government control. Uh, Bamiyan, which used to be under the Taliban, is now under Afghan government control. So these things come and go. But certainly this, this sort of mad iconoclasm, is, which you know, uh, we hadn't seen for centuries uh, and which returned with Mullah Omar uh, and Bamiyan in 2001, has become a, a terrible uh, habit now of jihadi groups. And uh, right. many of the great manuscripts of Timbuktu went up in flames. We lost the Buddhas of Bamiyan. And we've lost many of the most beautiful churches in Raqqa uh, and, uh, the, and uh, eastern Syria. Right. Uh, so some of the greatest yeah. crusader castles, some of yeah. the greatest shrines, uh, many of the Sufi shrines of Pakistan. And, mm -hmm. and this is, yeah, this is very widespread globally now. And we can't get those things back, as you mentioned. Now, some would ask, what's the difference between the iconoclasts who blow stuff up Right, so whether it's these sort of internal Salafi movements or whatever, and historically what colonial powers would do when they took over a place, they invaded a place, or even the East India Company went in and stole stuff and just took it back home for the Queen. You can see where I'm going to here. I'm bridging it towards your book. Someone would ask, what's the difference between the two? Sure. <laughs> I think there are two different things. I mean, obviously, iconoclasm is something that's happened in the West, too. I mean, if you look at the English cathedrals, uh, our own English Reformation iconoclasts disliking idols, using the same Abrahamic passages that you have in the Quran. 
um, uh, destroyed many of the most beautiful artworks in medieval England. And um, iconoclasm seems to me one thing, looting is another. Uh, and, you know, this is something imperial powers do across the, uh, 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 you know, across the centuries. If you think of the centre of your own Istanbul, it's full of uh, treasures from Egypt, which uh, the Byzantines moved there, the Ottomans did the same. If you go to Topkapi, uh -huh. you see uh, the uh, wonderful footstool and jewels of... Uh, uh, of the Mughal Empire, which uh, was taken by Nadir Shah from Iran and then given to the Ottoman Sultan. So um, many of the Mughal goodies that didn't end up in London are now in Istanbul. Yeah. <laughs> you can see yeah. where I'm going. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd love to walk around Sultan Ahmed with you and, and, and get the historical tour. Uh, now, you and Anita Anand wrote <laughs> specifically about the Kohinoor diamond. Tell me why you decided to write about this diamond. Well, the Kohinoor diamond is interesting because it's, it's a, uh, one of the most desired objects in the world. That, that simply, it's a, of all the diamonds, of all the gemstones in world history, the Kohinoor has been seized by more people, desired by more people. And even today, there are six countries other than Britain which claim it. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Iran and the Taliban all have uh, put in legal uh, uh, claims for this diamond. Of course, today it sits in the Tower of London, um, with uh, in the Queen Mother's Jewel. But uh, uh, at different times, it's been part of the peacock throne of the Mughals. It's been uh, moved to Herat by Nadir Shah of Persia. It got taken from there to Afghanistan by Ahmed Shah Durrani, uh, from Afghanistan to the Sikh Empire of Ranjit Singh, each time moving by violence and looting and bloodshed. Uh, and then the, the East India Company were the last to loot it in 1849, and it's been here ever since. Now, something you wrote of in the book is that anybody who encountered it, who possessed it or coveted it, usually ended up uh, in not such a good place. They met uh, with a terrible end. Is there a one re ring that <laughs> rules them all, my precious element to this diamond? <laughs> <laughs> there is very much a parallel with that. This is something which, uh, I mean, whether you believe in curses or not, has sort of seen its owners suffer terrific misfortune century after century. Uh, and, uh, and each one of its owners tends to lose it through, through a, a defeat in battle or some terrible personal disaster. Its owners at various times have been blinded. Uh, crowned with molten lead, had their eyeballs picked out, uh, have been slow poisoned, beaten to death with bricks. Uh, monuments have been made to fall down on their heads. I mean, it's a, it's a grisly story. And, and uh, we, you know, when we started work on this program, we thought that we were uh, doing a you know, rather sort of straightforward archival historical research, but it turned into a mixture of Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones pretty <laughs> quick. Is that why it's in the Tower of London and the, the Queen won't actually wear it? So the Queen has never worn it. Um, and uh, the only um, monarch who ever wore it in this country was Queen Victoria. Um, uh, Queen, uh, Prince Albert died soon after that. I don't know whether you could blame other subsequent disasters such as Brexit on the, <laughs> on the Cohen Hall, but uh, it certainly tends to bring, uh, bring havoc wherever it goes. And as I say, even today, six different countries dispute the ownership. Mm -hmm. And in the book, you talk about how, you know, the Cohen Hall only sort of became famous in a way because it was displayed um, in Hyde Park, the great exhibition of 1851. So in a way, even though it was highly coveted and in in incredibly valuable, the whole world didn't know about it, but then they did after it was displayed. After it was stolen, it was looted and then displayed, right? Might there be a similar parallel these days where, apart from some specialists, Correct. people don't know about Palmyra, but now they do because Daesh blew up those beautiful arches? Or again, people didn't really know about the monuments of Timbuktu and the mm -hmm. great manuscripts of Timbuktu until Al-Qaeda uh, Sahara branch moved in and started destroying that. You're right. I mean, there's a terrible sort of glamour that comes with, with this destruction. Ditto the Bamiyan Buddhas in Afghanistan. Right. What can we learn from the journey of the Kohinoor diamond? From, from everything you've learned, you know, uh, dipping into the archives, translating, you know, the, the Persian and, and, and so on. What can we learn fr from that journey of this diamond to where it is now and dealing with some of our contemporary challenges? I think the history of the Koh-i-Noor shows, you know, that, that man has coveted uh, beautiful objects and is prepared to go to very ruthless lengths throughout history to, to get their hands on it. 
Diamonds are particularly uh, susceptible, I think, to, to this sort of uh, vortex of violence in that they're obviously enormously portable. A, a, a single diamond can support, uh, you know, uh, uh, c can bring a fortune to, to a, a family for generations, but mm -hmm. uh, can fit in someone's pocket. So the urge to, to kill and steal with something like that is obviously I immense. And throughout history... Uh, as early as the you know 10th century BC, Indian texts are talking about diamonds bringing curses with them, uh, and this is something we observe even today. Yeah, and this is certainly something I'm, I'm going to be telling my my wife about. Good lesson: don't cover diamonds at all. Um, any new books on the horizon? <laughs> before I let you go, <laughs> yes, I'm uh, I'm going to be. Um, writing a big history of the East India Company next. This was the world's first great corporation, but also the world's most violent. Uh, people talk about the British taking over India, but it was actually something much more sinister. It was the, uh, it was the world's first multinational corporation run from an office in London, which took over the whole of the Mughal Empire. Right. Um, and uh, it's a hell of a story. It's an extraordinary story. Well, looking forward to it. And I, and I think, yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't, uh, don't presume that uh, this happened in the past. They talk about major corporations these days running governments. Well, it happened on a bigger scale back then, didn't it? This, this is a far more threatening thing than anything we have today. I mean, imagine Walmart with infantry regiments or Facebook or Google with fighter jets or nuclear submarines. Give it time. Idea of the, give it time. <laughs> I hope, I hope <laughs> we'll never see anything like as violent as the East India right. Company again. It, by 1800, it had 200,000 troops, twice the size of the British right. Army. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and was obviously run by shareholders for profit. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I can't think of anything in the world I'd less like to be taken over, it, taken over by or colonized by than the East India Company. Right, right. Uh, important concepts. Looking forward to that book as well. William Dalrymple, thank you very much for joining us. That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. Thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.